90.7 WFAE, this is Charlotte Talks. I'm Tom Bullock in for Mike Collins. Ten years ago today, lines of people waited for Apple and AT&T stores to open, all so they could be among the first to buy it. If you build it, they will come. They lined up overnight to buy the phone of the future and now the present. So why have you been here since Monday at 5 a.m.? Because I wanted to be amongst the first people in the world to see what the iPhone is like. This is going to be the, the biggest movement in cell phone history. Steve Jobs is like the man. He knows what's hot. He knows what we want. By today's standards, the first iPhone seems quaint. A three and a half inch display, a two megapixel camera, no onboard voice to answer your questions. Still, it was revolutionary right down to its shape. Not a clamshell with a hinge at the top, but a simple rectangle with rounded corners, four buttons, and one switch. A glass screen taking up almost all of the face. No physical QWERTY keyboard nestled below the display. Its iconic form now the basic template for almost every smartphone maker on Earth. The iPhone dethroned giant corporations and launched powerful new rivals like Android and Samsung. It changed the Internet itself and how humans interact with each other. It spurred controversies from production facilities so demanding they were dubbed suicide factories to a wave of digital waste, all in just 10 years' time. So today, we explore all this and more. And joining me to do so are Stephen Levy, a longtime uh, tech reporter who is now editor-in-chief at Back Channel, a digital tech news publication from Wired. He joins us from New York via Skype. Thanks for joining us, Stephen. It's my pleasure. And John MacArthur, an associate professor at the James L. Knight School of Communications at Queen's University here in Charlotte. John studies how we interact with technology and how technology can fundamentally change us. Welcome to the show. I should turn on your microphone. Welcome to the show. Good morning. And uh, we have another guest, a big fan, who's going to be joining us here in just a bit. But first, I want to say, uh, as always, we'd love to hear your questions today about the iPhone, Android, or smartphones in general. Did you wait in line for the first iPhone 10 years ago? What are the problems you see with our digital lives? Send us an email to charlottetalks at wfae.org, or just search for Charlotte Talks on Facebook and Twitter. And Stephen, I want to start with you for a simple, obvious reason. You were covering the iPhone since right before it really was launched. And even before we get all into all of that, Let's set the ground for what the world was like before this launch. Mobile phone sales were booming, but they were dominated by three companies we simply don't hear much about anymore, Motorola, BlackBerry, and Nokia. What could their cell phones do? Well, they could make phone calls, <laughs> and uh, that, that was the, the, the main function. You could, you know, there was sort of a nascent form of text messaging um, some of them could, in theory, get on the web. They had these limited uh, operating systems, but it, it, it was so hard to use and so unsatisfying on those little LED black and white screens that you wouldn't bother to do it. Um, and the reason why is because these carriers controlled their market. And, you know, and they really uh, didn't emphasize the customer experience, let's say. Uh, you know, they, they sold you a connection. Uh, and they wanted to control the uh, industry that made the headsets that you bought, and they dictated what it was that the manufacturers would do. Uh, and it was all built around about how they can collect fees on different things. So uh, for a long time, the innovators in Silicon Valley couldn't crack that market. And it took a guy like Steve Jobs, and actually it literally took Steve Jobs, to find one of these carriers and say, listen, we're going to be good for you uh, if you let us do all the designing. You know, forget all the restrictions that you put on the technology people. We're going to design it. Uh, we're going to give you the exclusive for a while. So people who buy this phone will have to use your network and – It'll be great for everyone. And it was. And, and he did that with AT&T, which at the time, if I remember right, was not the best network for a phone like the iPhone. What, right. would, he, what was the deal there? He the deal actually with, with, with a company called Singular that wound up merging AT&T. And they were, they were the ones that just gave him the green light. So they literally just said, go for it. We'll, we'll follow your lead. That's right. So at the time, I mean, Apple had been making computers for decades, of course. Max, uh, the Apple II was a huge hit, but it had really slipped off into obscurity. Then around 2001, or I believe it was 2001, they suddenly resurfaced with really a, 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 another revolutionary product, the iPod. 
And they jumped back into prominence. We were all introduced to this idea of a really easy-to-use digital music player. And more importantly, for us and for Apple, the iTunes store, where you could buy music to fill up your digital library. These were hugely profitable for Apple. So why did Steve Jobs want to make the jump to the mobile phone market, which at the time sounded very, very risky? So the, the iPod, which, which you mentioned, you know, was really a turning point for Apple. And I actually wound up writing a book about it called The Perfect Thing. And it really changed Apple from a company which provided pretty high quality computers to a niche market of fans. It was kind of the BMW on computers, um, you know, whereas the, you know, the, the computers in the Microsoft family really dominated uh, the whole field. And Apple was never going to get dominant market share in personal computers. Um, but they came out with this little device and turned out to be by far the leader in this pretty wide uh, mass market consumer niche of uh, music players. Mm -hmm. So it, it opened the possibility that Apple could do this on a, a bigger scale. And clearly, uh, mobile technology, you know, was giving you not only the, you know, the the bandwidth, you know, the, you know, you could you know, use uh, them to, to use voice, but you could use it to use information, the same information you used when you plugged in your computer to the internet or used wireless Wi-Fi to do that. Um, so this was going to be a massive opportunity. And for years before, people were speculating about the Apple phone. When is Apple going to do a phone? And Steve would say, well, these carriers, you know, they, they won't let us do it our way. Hmm. Um, so it, it wasn't a surprise when Apple was finally able to do it, but it was, as I'm sure we'll talk about, super impressive that when they finally did do it, they were able to be so creative and you know, uh, work with such a, a blank canvas as opposed to building on the kind of clunky stuff that went before. Sure. Well, let's get into that, but let's, let's start with a, an event that I believe you were at in January 2007. This is months, obviously, before the phone itself was sold. But this is when Steve Jobs announced to the world that the iPhone was indeed coming and that it was going to merge three devices into one for a first. So, three things. A widescreen iPod with touch controls, a revolutionary mobile phone, and a breakthrough internet communications device. An iPod, a phone, and an internet communicator. An iPod, a phone. Are you getting it? These are not three separate devices. This is one device. And we are calling it iPhone. Today, Today, Apple is going to reinvent the phone. Now, long before most people would get a chance to stand in line and plunk down either, what, five or six hundred dollars to get that phone, Stephen, you were picked as one of four tech journalists to preview the iPhone, to actually get it in your hands and take it for a test drive. How on earth did you score that? <laughs> Um, you know, it, it, I guess what really made it unusual in my inclusion in that quartet was the other three people were full-time product reviewers. Uh, they, for their respective you know, newspapers, all of them, uh, you know, the, the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and USA Today, that was their job. They reviewed products. I was the chief technology correspondent for Newsweek at that time. Uh, I was mainly a reporter. Every so often, I'd review a product. But I had a good relationship with Steve Jobs. Uh, I had been writing about technology for a long time. Uh, somehow, I got it, you know, and I wasn't going to say no. <laughs> I don't blame you. So, I, you know, Steve Jobs in particular and Apple as well are known for their secrecy. Um, I'm dying to know how they gave you that phone and the whole story of taking it out. But I want to start with how you actually physically got the phone to take it for a test drive. You almost imagine, you know, a special courier with a metal briefcase handcuffed to their wrist. How did they deliver it to you? Well, uh, actually, it was pretty much that. They weren't going to trust <laughs> FedEx or UPS or the U.S. Mail or, you know, dedicated couriers, uh, you know, uh, to simply drop it off 
into my office. Uh, they came to my office, a few of them, and um, and I think they they did this little trip. Weirdly, uh, all the reviewers were on the West, East Coast. The Apple's on the West Coast, hmm. so they just went up and down the coast to uh, to Washington to give it to Walt Mossberg and. Um, I'm not sure where, where the USA Today guy was, but I know he's on the East Coast. And then uh, to Connecticut to give it to David Pogue and to New York City uh, to the Newsweek office to not just drop it off and leave, but to make sure I had some familiarity with it. They didn't want us stumbling around and doing stupid things. So we would write that, you know, I can't figure out this thing. So they, they gave us a little tutorial. And, of course, I'm sure the others shared my experience. During the whole tutorial, I'm thinking, get the heck out of here. I, w I want to start playing with it my own, on my own. <laughs> so what was it like? I mean, you, you in your review, you're right. It really starts kind of with the box, like that classic Apple packaging. Yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's beautiful. And uh, uh, this is something that uh, I think Jobs loved uh, – certainly design, but I think he loved Japanese design too. Um, and if you go to Japan and you buy like a notebook in a stationery store, they sit there and they wrap it and it's a work of art in and of itself. So Apple products, since Jobs really returned to Apple after um, his exile in the 80s, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, he came back in 1997, uh, took over again. And from then on, he had this cadence of releasing products in these beautiful packages, you know, that, you know, it almost you know, broke your heart to, you know, break the cellophane and open them up because it would never be that perfect again. And, you know, everything was just cited perfectly and folded perfectly. And, and that started the whole trend of people doing videos on YouTube of just unboxing uh, products like that. So in this case, you know, it's a beautiful black little box and you lifted it up and sitting there like the Hope Diamond is the, your iPhone. And what was it like? I mean, you, you write about walking around, I believe it was in Pittsburgh, being able to multitask on a phone where you've never been able to do that before. Yeah, that's right. About a day after I got the phone, I had to go to Pittsburgh. Uh, and it was just going to be a trip, not overnight. Um, I actually had enough this idea. Uh, there was this uh, you know, DJ you know, mixologist called Girl Talk. Uh, and, you know, who was in trouble because he, you know, used, you know, lots of different music for his songs. And there was a Congress person in who represented Pittsburgh, you know, which is his hometown, who defended him in Congress. And I thought, uh, these guys have never met. Let me broker a conversation between them. Mm -hmm. So I flew to Pittsburgh to do that. And I took along my little iPhone. And as it turned out, I got stuck there. The, that night there was a thunderstorm. You're remembering this is June. This is mid-June in 2007. And I hadn't brought my computer, but I found I could do almost everything just with this little iPhone. I could get all my email. I could even watch a movie. Um, of course, I could call my wife and tell her I wasn't coming home. Uh, you know, all the stuff that I would have done with my computer, I was able to do with the iPhone. And this was without any preparation, no manual. I'd had the thing for a day. So that let me know, wow, this is something different. This is not your flip phone. All right, we've got about 30 seconds before the break, but I want to ask you this. There's one line in your review that particularly intrigued me. You said the phone came pretty close to the bombast of, of the hype that was going on. Pretty close, but it didn't hit at 100%? No, we could talk about that later. <laughs> All right, fair enough. We're speaking with Stephen Levy, tech writer, a longtime tech writer, about the iPhone's 10th anniversary. We'll continue speaking with him and with two other guests here uh, after this short break. You're listening to Charlotte Talks on 90.7 WFAE. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and the New York production of C.S. Lewis on stage, The Most Reluctant Convert, in Charlotte for two performances only, Friday and Saturday, July 14th and 15th at the Knight Theater. More information at cslewisonstage.com. On the local news roundup, a citizen's panel finds fault with CMPD's conclusion that last year's shooting of Keith Scott was justified. The panel says there was substantial evidence of error, but the police department is standing by its finding. Governor Cooper puts his veto stamp to work on the state budget, and Republican lawmakers swiftly cancel out that veto. Murmurings of possible impeachment in Raleigh targeting Secretary of State Elaine Marshall, and city funding for a possible Charlotte Major League Soccer Stadium might not be out of bounds just yet. A roundtable of reporters will recap the week's news when Charlotte Talks tomorrow morning at 9, here on 90.7 WFAE.
Tom Ashbrook. Coming up on the next On Point, no cameras allowed. Dueling press secretaries briefing blow-ups. We'll look at the increasingly fraught relationship between the White House and the reporters who cover it. That's coming up on the next On Point from NPR. Stay tuned for that conversation with On Point following Charlotte Talks from 10 till noon here on listener-funded 90.7 WFAE, Charlotte's NPR news source. This is Charlotte Talks on 90.7 WFAE. I'm Tom Bullock, and we're talking iPhone right now with Stephen Levy, a longtime tech reporter who is now editor-in-chief of Back Channel from Wired. And just before the break, Stephen, uh, I asked you that one phrase in your review that this almost lived up to all the hype when you first got that, that very first model of the iPhone. What was lacking? Well, for one thing, uh, it was painstakingly slow. Hmm. Uh, the network that you use at the time... And this was partly because when it was and partly because uh, it wasn't the fastest network uh, it could take a, a very long time. And sometimes, you know, it just failed uh, to deliver the Web pages in time. Um, so that and that was a problem, and it was especially a problem if you were in a zone that where the coverage was even good by the standards of AT&T, which was the, the, the only carrier at that time. So that was one problem. There are other kinds of little glitches there. I actually never, even to this day, don't love typing on a soft keyboard like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, uh, that takes a while to get used to. But even now, uh, 10 years later, half the emails I get have a little sentence on the bottom saying, forgive typos, I'm typing on a, on a phone. So <laughs> uh, we haven't really mastered that. And the other thing was, that I was disappointed, and this, I talked about this with Steve Jobs literally a, a, an hour after he introduced it in January on stage. I went backstage and we discussed this, and I was surprised that they weren't opening up the iPhone so third-party software developers would be able to write apps for it uh, that really got into the guts of it, and you know, and I was even more convinced that that was a mistake. You know, and I, I told Steve, and he brushed it off. Um, he said, well, it wouldn't be safe for the network. Um, uh, but I was even more convinced that that was the case after I used the, the, the phone because the applications that were written directly, and they let a couple places do it, like Google um, with YouTube uh, and Google Maps, uh, they were spectacular. And the Apple you know, uh, mail and, and the web browser was really great. And so I, I knew right away, uh, particularly with the slowness of the network, that writing applications built into the web and accessing them through a web browser wasn't the way to do it. And, uh, and I think uh, I wrote that Apple should do that and, you know, in my review. That, uh, and it took them over a year, but finally they did do that. And that's when the iPhone really took off uh, because people wrote, they treated it like the computer it was and took advantage of its portability, its mobility, uh, to come up with new kinds of apps that assumed you were there all the time and, you know, and use the power of the phone. Uh, and that's why they were able to say and a couple of years later, there's an app for that. And then soon they were able to say there's an app for that, meaning stuff that you didn't even know there was a that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and it, it actually... Uh... It gets to the very heart and uh, well, it actually aid me to get another one of our guests in the conversation here because it gets to the heart of what is the iPhone and all smartphones. It is absolutely access to anything about that you can conceive of in your purse or your pocket. And um, I want to go to just a quick, we are taking, of course, questions. Um, you can reach us on Facebook or Twitter or email us at, at charlottetalks at wfae.org. Bert on t Twitter writes, an amazing amount of information at your fingertips, but easy to become a distraction. Discipline is key. I think anyone who's had a smartphone knows that is exactly the case. Um, but one person in particular can talk about this more than just about anyone else. I want to welcome John MacArthur to the program. Again, thank you for coming in today. Thank you for having me. Uh, can you hear us? All right. He is an associate professor at the James L. Knight School of Communications at Queen's University. And John studies how we interact with technology and how technology can fundamentally change us. He's also the author of Digital uh, Proxemics, How Technology Shapes the Way We Move. That distraction point, that is a real problem because it seems that technology now is constantly pulling us, specifically our smartphones, constantly pulling us to what is new, what is now, what is right in front of me. And distractions, it seems, are the norm. 
the iPhone, you know, is about the experience of the thing. So when we started to find these experiences coming from our mobile devices and our so the social media that was attached to those devices, we started to direct our attention toward the media that was in our pockets rather than our surroundings. And there's been a lot written and discussed about that over the last 10 years, especially in relationship to the iPhone, because it is such a unique experience. Yeah, and a big part, we were just talking about apps. Again, there just seems to be an app for everything. But I think if there was one experience, one thing about the iPhone that really set it apart in those early days, it's it's the screen. It's it's the fact that this was the first time we had a touch screen that was easily usable, that seemed easily usable. Although I, I happen to agree with Stephen, I'm still trying to figure out how to write on a soft keyboard. I may be dating myself there. The um, keyboard was the big deal. You know, when, when the iPhone came out, Moving from using buttons to not having buttons was a really big thing. Even the iPod had buttons, so you were used to using the wheel, you know, to turn between songs. But the the actual interface of the keyboard that was so intuitive, the keyboard popped up when you needed it, and it went away when you didn't. The phone almost knew when you wanted to type and when you didn't want to type. And that was off-putting, but it was also very, very smart because it opened up the entire hardware to the visual display. You know, I was walking uptown uh, with my daughter when she was three, and we got to this art gallery, and there was a television screen on the wall, and it was showcasing the art that was in the, in the art gallery, and she went up and tried to swipe it to see what picture would come up next. And it wasn't a touch screen, it was just a television. But it stood out to me because it made me realize that, you know, the generation that's coming up behind us, they think everything's a touch screen. Mm -hmm. When we got the iPhone, we nothing was a touch screen. We weren't used to that kind of technology, except for maybe signing your name at the grocery store or something. That was a, that was a new thing to have in your pocket, much less in your house. And Stephen, to go back with you, another new thing here is, again, combining devices into one single device. Uh, there were negative reviews about the iPhone where people questioned whether or not you really wanted your digital music player and your phone to be the same, you let alone having access to the Internet. Was it really that revolutionary of an idea at the time? Because it seems, it seems very obvious. Well, it wasn't that revolutionary an idea. Uh, people in technology have been trying to do that um, uh, for a long time and, you know, with varying success, but generally with not much success. Uh, Any time they tried to smush, you know, multiple functions into a device, it turned out that you know none of the functions worked as well as in a, a, a dedicated uh, device. But the, uh, as I wrote in my review, the iPhone is a convergence device where things really do converge. Things, you know, though oddly uh, you couldn't cut and paste on the original iPhone, but the uh, uh, it really worked well together. Um, uh, though I, I have to, do have to say, as a, a huge iPod aficionado, uh, nothing matches the classic uh, iPod, you know, <laughs> and, you know that, that final version of the iPod Classic um, uh, in terms of being a great music player. But, uh, you know, the iPhone still is, does a pretty good job. Now, uh, you know, it's easy for us when we're talking about this, the 10th anniversary of the iPhone, to, to be focusing on Apple's successes. They've had a lot of failures. And, and Kirby emails, why did the iPhone succeed where other Apple products failed? Anyone remember Newton? It too was supposed to launch a mobile revolution. So what was Newton and why did it fail? So Newton was a handheld device that came out in the early 1990s. Um, and it failed, uh, I think, largely because it was a little ahead of its time. Uh, the people on it were brilliant. Some of them were um, I had worked on the original Macintosh team. Um, they had some, you know, they really breakthroughs in handwriting recognition. You know, you would write on it with a stylus, and it would try to figure out what you wrote and translate it into uh, text. Um, but uh, the artificial intelligence wasn't to the point where that was flawless, and uh, we, you couldn't connect it like you could when the internet came along. So. Uh, that was sort of a missing piece to that. And uh, so I think that uh, no knock on the Newton, though people had great fun, particularly in Doonesbury, of, making, of mocking how it would take your text and uh, translate it into these sort of da-da versions. I but, remember that. You know, uh, it, you know, it, 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 you're right, it was not a success. Of course, Steve Jobs uh, 
blame him for that. He wasn't there then. <laughs> so that's a fair point. That was one of the fascinating things. He actually things. killed it when he got there. Yeah, well, that was one of the fascinating things about the iPhone was that it did connect previous technologies. So Paul McAvaney and the folks at MIT in the 80s were producing the video harp, which was this touchscreen glass player that played like a harp when you moved your fingers across it. And they pioneered the kind of uh, pinch to zoom model for, uh, for how to interact with touchscreens. And so that was way ahead of its time, too. I mean, it's, we had all of these inventions that were way ahead of their time, and the iPhone just collected them and innovated with them and made them different and better and put them in a, in a package um, in, a, in a really pioneering way. And the story of that packaging, of the creation of the iPhone, is actually documented in a new book that's out right now. It's called The One Device, The Secret History of the iPhone. It's written by Brian Merchant, who is also uh, the senior editor at Motherboard, uh, which is a tech and science news website from uh, Vice. He's on the phone now with us from Los Angeles. Brian, thanks for coming to the show. Hi, thanks so much for having me. So, uh, you know, we're talking about how the iPhone just pulled all of these different technologies together into one easy-to-use package. But the story of how that happened that you lay out very clearly in the book is, is, is kind of surprising. I mean, like all great projects, you write, this one had a code name, Purple. And, and then you go on to, to kind of lay out the strange thing that was happening in secret at Apple's Cupertino, California headquarters that to me almost sounds like something out of uh, the sci-fi show Black Mirror where suddenly an engineer would be sitting next to you and the next day he's gone, the chair's empty, you don't know what happened, they're off somewhere else. Walk us through the secret development of this product. Right. Well, once the decision was made inside Apple to – sort of do an iPhone to do a phone, what would become the iPhone, uh, it really did uh, sort of immediately take on this ultra-secret air. And as sources like uh, Tony Fidel tell me, this is just how Steve Jobs operated at that time. If we were going to do something, it was going to be in total secret. So that was sort of how the recruitment process for this project unfolded. Jobs told Forstall that he couldn't Scott Forstall, who was sort of the lead of the, the software end of the effort there. Um, and he told, and Jobs told Forstall that if, you know, you can't recruit anyone outside the company, but you're, feel free to pick the best people within the company. Um, but you still have to maintain this utmost level of secrecy uh, when you're going about it. So Forstall and his deputies would go around the, con- uh, the company and exactly as you said, they would say, uh, listen, um, you know, you are a star engineer at this company. You are one of our top people. You know, you may not know even who I am, but we know who you are. We've been watching you. Um, nothing ominous we, sounding here. <laughs> <laughs> right, nothing at all. We think you'd be perfect for this new project we have brewing, and unfortunately I can't tell you what that is. Um, I can't tell you it will consume your entire life. I can't tell you you'll be working weekends. It'll probably be harder than you've ever worked. You might not see your family all that much, um, and <laughs> we're giving you a chance to, uh, to to change every. Unfortunately, I can't tell you anything more, so I'm going to need your answer by the end of the day. Uh, so they really just kind of demand sort of kind of an on the spot response, <laughs> um, and and this is how you know they got most of the people were peaked and said, okay, this is Apple. This is the kind of stuff that I'm here to do. And a lot of people signed on, and some people said no. And slowly those chairs would sit empty, uh, as, as you mentioned. And, and it really was unclear to a lot of people at the company who weren't, um, you know, joining the secret project what, what the heck was actually going on. So it was, you know, the secret project brewing in this one wing uh, of, of Cupertino's campus. And it... Uh, became the, the Purple Project, which would become the iPhone software uh, arm. And the phone itself. Now, Brian, hang on one second. Yeah. The story that you just, you know, while this story was all happening under covers in Cupertino, Stephen Levy, did you, did the, did the tech world, did anybody have a, even as much as a sniff that something like this was going on? Well, the Apple rumor world is, you know, always pretty heated and, uh, you know, and there there have been, you know, there's a lot of speculation about it, but um, the backstory, you know, just came out um, 
painstakingly after you know like a number of years and you know uh, this book uh, you know is an important contribution to that all right well brian let's get back to you now um and, and i want to talk about the controversy some of the controversies around the iphone because it is important when you're talking about an anniversary to look at that as well but quickly if you wouldn't mind some of the early attempts at an iphone were rudimentary at best and if you can, there is one in particular moment that in your book that you that you lay out where you refer to it as almost a steampunk kind of mobile phone. This is the ill-fated iPod phone. Right. Uh, yeah. And well, first I just have to say uh, thanks for, for Stephen's kind words. Um, but it, yeah, absolutely. It was this kind of, you know, uh, in the early stages, it was this sort of amorphous, uh, project that could go in any number of directions. And one of the sort of ideas that made sense um, early on to a lot of people was to just take the uh, the iPod, which was then Apple's most uh, successful, sort of most iconic consumer uh, product at, at the time. It was kind of what had taken Apple out of being just a computer company into being sort of a more of a more of an everything company or at least started that transition um, and it was conveniently phone shaped it was conveniently very well recognized um, and the, sort of some of the initial uh, imperatives to do a phone inside Apple were, were strictly business related um, a lot of sources told me was that you know we knew that having uh, an iPod sort of be our big cash cow, uh, one executive told me, was problematic in that it was very vulnerable to sort of the fast-evolving um, uh, smartphones of the time. So cell phones were getting faster, they were getting smarter, they were picking up more functionalities, and most importantly, they were picking up the capacity to, to load music, to store MP3s. Mm -hmm. um, and if you, you know, the consumer, were facing a prospect of, you know, Sticking, a, you know, a, a two, you know, pocket-sized gadgets on your person when you're leaving the door, or just one. Even if one of them was the cool iPod, there's a chance that you're gonna, you know, just stick with the cell phone, even if it was worse. So they were really viewing it as a threat. Um, so there's a sense that 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 Jobs and, and and some of the executives wanted to move quickly. Um, and even though that they were aware at the time of the technology, this, the multi-touch uh, based screen and uh, that sort of interaction paradigm that would later become the, the centerpiece of the iPhone, um, even though they were aware of that, it, they were just worried it would take too long. So they said, hey, what if we could just graft a phone sort of functionality onto the iPod and then we could kind of make use of all this like brand awareness, make use of the fact that we just kind of have this really cool gadget. But it also ready. took advantage of that click wheel. You describe it as almost being, <laughs> uh, that's just why we call it uh, kind of steampunk. It looked like it and functioned almost like a right. rotary phone as a smartphone. Well, yeah, that was its ultimate undoing. Um, I would imagine that... so, especially for a company like <laughs> Apple that doesn't necessarily want to take you back to the days of Ma Bell. But, right. I mean, there's a reason we moved past that rotary dial, right? Exactly. Um, <laughs> well, we're going to have to hold on there for a second. Um, we are going to talk about the controversies and competitors to the iPhone here. Uh, just after a quick break, you're listening to Charlotte Talks on 90.7 WFAE. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and the Harvey B. Gantt Center, hosting a presentation this Saturday, The Intersection of Art and Culture with Ja He of PE 2.0, the next generation of public enemy, preserving hip-hop culture beyond performance, GantCenter.org. A blow-up in the White House press briefing room this week highlights tensions between the Trump administration and the reporters covering it. The daily briefings were must-see TV in the early days of the new administration, but lately the White House has been insisting on off-camera briefings, and the Washington press corps is fuming. Coming up in 20 minutes at 10 o'clock, on point with Tom Ashbrook, we'll talk with several White House correspondents, and Ari Fleischer, who is press secretary for George W. Bush. That's coming up at 10 o'clock. If you'd like to join our conversation on the iPhone's 10th anniversary, email charlottetalks at wfae.org, contact us through Facebook or Twitter at Charlotte Talks.
Martin Grable, President and CEO, Community Blood Center of the Carolinas, talks about underwriting on WFAE. We get to support a community-based public radio station reaching a diverse group of local listeners. And I can't tell you how many times people come up to me and say they've heard our message on WFAE. Underwriting on WFAE says a lot about your business. Learn more. Email underwriting at WFAE.org. This is Charlotte Talks on 90.7 WFAE. I'm Tom Bullock in for Mike Collins. We're talking the iPhone on this, its 10th birthday. And we're doing so with Stephen Levy, a longtime tech reporter who is now editor-in-chief of Back Channel, uh, which is from Wired Magazine. Brian Merchant, author of the new book, The One Device. And he's also senior editor with Motherboard and Professor John MacArthur of Queen's University, who studies how we interact with technology and how technology can change us. Right before the break, we were kind of talking about the secret history of the creation of the iPhone. But Stephen and Brian, I want to, of course, get to some of the controversies, because any coverage of the iPhone wouldn't be fair without bringing up things like these factories, the production facilities in China, which were run by a company called Foxconn, that became later known as suicide factories. Stephen, do you want to start with that? What was the story there? Well, um, I guess, you know, uh, Apple, like a lot of companies, uh, manufactures in China, um, you know, and it isn't solely because of the salaries there. It's the, you know, uh, the way the whole technology ecosystem works is the, you know, the you know, supply chain and everything else uh, works, works, works better there. So, you know, even if... Um, uh, American workers you know, agreed to work at the, at the rate, you know, the, the salary of Chinese workers. Uh, it, you know, they really couldn't just open a factory and bang, that would be it. But obviously, uh, people have gone into these uh, factories and showed the conditions, you know, weren't ideal. And there's been, you know, uh, uh, all sorts of reports of um, tough conditions there. And you know, it's uh, probably not a place. Even if they did go to America, that a lot of people might want to work there, and Apple's tried to deal with that. And, Brian, you've actually been to some of these factories, I believe. Yeah. Um, I was able to get inside one of the, the sort of the most iconic factories. Um, it's no longer sort of the main uh, iPhone factory, but Longhua in, in Shenzhen is sort of was for a while Foxconn's sort of flagship operation. Um, and... I was curious uh, specifically to see how uh, uh, how conditions were sort of today, um, and how they'd evolved since there was the uh, that that outbreak that you that you mentioned or that you were referring to uh, was was in 2010, I believe, six or seven years ago, when sort of there was what was termed a, a suicide epidemic, um, when a lot of workers kind of sort of were moved both sort of out of desperation and sort of a, a form of public protest uh, very tragically sort of did commit suicide. Um, you know, there's, I think, 16 or 18 of them in, in a year. So it, it, it did garner headlines and it did sort of shed light on sort of the, the conditions there, which were more um, psychologically difficult than actually sort of physically difficult. Um, it, a lot of people who had migrated uh, from sort of more rural parts of China to to do this work, which was which is very exacting, repetitive, sort of difficult work. Um, lots of overtime that was kind of looked at like the overtime is more or less sort of mandated in a lot of cases, or highly incentivized at least, and a difficult sort of managerial structure where. Um, Kind of things like public shaming are kind of part and parcel with with, with, with the pretty, work culture. Yeah, it was so pretty it all brutal kind of, conditions. Right. It, it did. It did sound like brutal conditions, and you know, after we we hadn't heard as much about it um, since that the initial um, spate of headlines and the initial outbreak. So I, I was really curious to see how things had had progressed or how. And did they change? You went. Have they changed? Uh. It, Based on the interviews that I was able to gather and and what I saw, it seems that they've improved somewhat. But uh, but again, since this is such a sort of psych psychological problem, that it seemed like they really they hadn't changed a lot. Um, I was told that there were still suicides uh, with some regularity. Hmm. It's still uh, sort of an oppressive work culture. It's still and it's uh, as much as anything, it's still 
difficult to get rid of that sort of part of the atmosphere there. A lot of people talked about this ghost of death that hangs over Langwa. Um, and it was specific to this factory. Uh, so it, it really sort of spoke to, you know, the cultural factors as much as the, the actual sort of physical environment. Okay. I want to go to a listener email very quickly. Um, Adam emails us, while the iPhone may have decreased face-to-face human interaction, we've all seen this, of course, this is my own aside, people faces directly down on their phone as they're walking around, or we do tend to do more on the phone than in person. Adam asks, has the iPhone increased human interaction with public spaces on a larger scale? And John, that sounds right up your alley. Yeah, well, the question for the question for all of us in terms of the way that the iPhone causes us to interact with spaces is can the space connect to the iPhone? And, you know, for a while, everything was trying to connect to the iPhone, our cars, um, our navigation devices, uh, public spaces, cameras all over the world. Um, so in terms of connecting to the space, the space has to be enabled with the technology to be able to speak with the iPhone so that we can interact directly with us. And when that happens, that can tell us a great deal about the spaces. You know, the, the thing that the iPhone iPhone did for us that we weren't ready for, I think, was geolocation. And that was positioning us in a geographic location on the earth and saying, this is where I am currently. And and this is actually another controversy when it comes to the iPhone in particular and smartphones in general, the amount of data that is, I mean, that that is tracked. The iPhone knows where you go, where you've been, what you surf, uh, who you call, how long you talk to them. It's so many things. It's, it really seems to me almost like it sponges up who you are, whether you're willing to admit it or not. Absolutely. It contains an inordinate amount of data. <laughs> I mean, when you think about the amount of information that that is encased about you inside the phone, um, it, it has... It has everything. And in fact, so much so that the courts have actually uh, prohibited the search of your, uh, the data on your iPhone um, in cases of privacy um, when, you're, when you're being investigated by law enforcement or whatever. Sure. All right. Well, we've talked obviously a lot about Apple. It is their birthday for the iPhone. That makes a lot of sense. But I want to talk about some of their competitors. In particular, uh, I want to talk about Android and I want to talk about AI, artificial intelligence. But Let's talk about the big competitor to Apple and actually its software that runs its phones. Android is, of course, run by Google, owned by Google. And it actually, and this may surprise some people, it actually has the vast majority of the smartphone market working. It powers it. Um, Stephen, how big of a player is Apple or is uh, Android, rather? I know its, its market share is huge. Right. No, it, it is, as, you know, clearly as, as a significant player as, as the... Um, a, a large majority of the uh, phones in operation around the world run on the Android system. And this is something I, I was able to, you know, uh, look at and document that, you know, competition when I wrote a book about Google and, you know, and discovered uh, the, the extent of the, you know, uh, ill feelings between the two companies, mainly on, on Steve Jobs's part, when he felt that basically Google stole uh, all the ideas from the iPhone from him while they were pretending to be his buddy. And, you know, uh, Eric Schmidt, who was then the CEO of Google, was on Apple's board. And, you know, for a while, he sort of recused himself from uh, decisions that had to do with uh, uh, the iPhone uh, on Apple's board. And then he eventually had to resign and uh, from the board, and you know, and, and Steve Jobs, you know, uh, died bitter about this. Hmm. And, and of course, it's not just it's not just Android. I mean, I think a lot of people would be surprised that the company that has sold the most handsets, the physical phone, is not Apple; it's Samsung. And right. Samsung uses the Google system. Yeah, and and actually, it wasn't until Samsung had the Galaxy Seven battery problem where the batteries run so hot that in some cases they actually caught fire that Apple was able to take over a percentage of the market share but Samsung itself is still going strong and they're talking about relaunching the the 7 or the I guess the next line the 8 here relatively quickly yeah no they already I mean they already you know it's it's interesting how quickly that debacle has passed, right? You know, I mean, it's a uh, Samsung is not dead in the water even after their phones was, were catching fire. Um, you know, it's a very powerful company. Um, they're not as elegant in the way they uh, integrate innovations into their technology, but they do innovate. And uh, it's because of Samsung that we have, you know, you know, big 
uh, versions of the iPhones. Steve Jobs didn't like it. He believed that uh, you should be able to hold a phone and your thumb should be able to go everywhere. So he resisted, you know, these like tablet-like uh, mm -hmm. phones, that, you know, that Samsung first introduced. But they proved so popular that you know that Apple had to make their phones bigger. So you have the iPhone Plus, which is you know this big, the biggest iPhone yet. All right, so we've only got a few minutes left in the program, and I don't want to leave without asking this. Ten years ago, we were first introduced to the modern smartphone. Um, it was not the first. Uh, unfortunately, Brian, we won't have time to get into it, but it's the, I would encourage people to, to read your book because the story of the Simon is fascinating, um, which was invented actually for IBM in 1993 and bears a whole lot of resemblance to the iPhone. Um, but looking ahead, um, the iPhone, the, the level of innovation at the iPhone seems to be slowing. The level of innovation of, of smartphones overall, I'm wondering if they are as well. Have we basically reached the maximum of what a cell phone can do, and where do we go from here? Stephen, let's, let's start with you. Well, I don't think we've reached the maximum, but as you say, you know, probably a lot of the big things that have been done. I think that, um, it, you know, I, I sat down with an Apple executive, Phil Schiller, uh, on the 10th anniversary of the introduction, and he was talking about what the iPhone will be like in 50 years. There's not going to be an iPhone in 50 years. Mm -hmm. That that We all know that. Mm -hmm. You're not going to carry around this thing in your pocket 50 years later. It's going to be, you know, ubiquitous. It'll be in the air. Like, you know, you should look to Amazon Echo and other things like that um, as ways that we'll be in touch with the the virtual world or maybe even living in it. Brian. Yeah. Um, I, just to play devil's advocate for Stephen, I, I think he's I think he's probably right. Um, but in maybe 10, 20 years, I think we might actually still have uh, something that looks a lot like the smartphone. And as you were saying, maybe the sort of the, the biggest sort of most demonstrable kind of kind of innovation, things that would really change the look or the feel of the phone are slowing. Uh, but they are, you know, making great iterative progress in the features and the and the things you know the bigger screen that Stephen mentioned was you know that for a lot of people really changed the phone experience so there are certain things that will continue continue to see sort of uh, improved expanded tweaked uh, but you know until we really do hit that next paradigm whether it's sort of a voice interaction system that works for everybody or something uh, you know that's only on a drawing board uh, somewhere that we don't you know, even know yet, uh, it, it does remain to be seen just how long we'll keep carting around these, these phones in our pocket. But it seems to me that Apple, as successful as the iPhone is, and there is no doubt that it is hugely successful, they kind of need a new hit. I mean, the iPad is pretty good uh, in terms of sales. The iWatch, not as much. Uh, are they, are we starting to see the, 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 the allure of the iProduct dip the future really is in the experience right i mean the the iphone the thing that made it so elegant and mysterious right was the experience so all of these things that you just described are giving you a similar experience as the iphone it's the touching the feeling the the motion with your fingers and using voice command i think the next big movement forward is in the intuitiveness of the technology can it predict what i want can it deliver an experience to me um through the internet that provides me with something that I need in real time. Hmm. Brian. You know, I, I wonder if Apple really does need a brand new product. Um, it, the iPhone does so unprecedentedly well in so many ways. Um, it, it's, it's marquee product is sort of this world conquering, uh, device. And if it finds, you know, if Apple finds ways to, to get it into more, into more markets and to sort of continually sort of master its product class, you know, it, I, I could really see sort of the revenue staying high. It, maybe it's not exciting. Maybe it's not what everybody wants to hear, but I personally don't see a big problem with Apple sort of becoming a little, you know, more predictable and just kind of really mastering its product lines. And that's what it's done under Tim Cook. And I could see that continuing to happen, just more emphasis on the product lines it has. And sure, there'll be more stuff coming out, but I don't think there's necessarily that, you know, that need to innovate. I mean, they're doing pretty well already. Steven. Um, I think the, you know, the, the, 
it's in plain sight now. The Worldwide Developer Conference that Apple had in June, um, early this month, uh, they talked about virtual reality and augmented reality. And I think that's going to be the next big thing for Apple. I do feel that um, it's Apple's DNA to innovate. And recently I got a tour of the new headquarters with Jonathan Ive, who's the, sort of the design creative wizard of, of, of Apple there. And I was looking at you know some of the amazing things in this building. There's these four story high glass doors that are bigger than airline hangar doors that you know that, that, that silently slide open and I said boy what wh what do you need these you know 500 ton glass doors in your cafeteria and he just like raised an eyebrow and said well it depends on what you mean by need don't don't you and so I think you know apple uh, it's like the shark in in any hall right you know they've got to innovate or die hmm. go ahead brian no, that's, I, that's, I, I think that's interesting. I, I would love to, to have been on that tour, too, and just to see that. It, it is interesting how they do sort of infuse everything that they do with sort of that culture and that spirit of design and of innovation. Um, it is really, it really is interesting to me to think about, you know, what may or may not happen next. I mean, if we look back at how much the iPhone has changed over 10 years, and, yeah, it's gotten faster, a little bigger, beefier, but that sort of basic sort of design paradigm, that, that fundamental sort of collection of, of apps uh, and multi-touch uh, and a web browser has more or less sort of carried through. And that's the same thing that powers the iPad. So it was such a powerful thing that created this new standard that I would be interested to see how long that will persevere. And I wouldn't be sort of surprised if it did for All right. Well, and that's where we're going to have to leave it. We are nearly out of time. Stephen Levy, Brian Merchant, John MacArthur. Thank you all for joining us to talk about the uh, iPad or iPhone's 10th anniversary. Charlotte talks with Mike.